Another term is that of beneficial accumulators. So these are the flowering plants that attract the adult parasitic wasps and flies, which in turn lay their eggs and larvae into the pests that are after our fruit. And you don't have larvae getting the larvae of the pests unless you have the habitat for the adult forms of these different insects. So beneficial accumulators start to build those numbers. And here I'm talking about things like the cyphid fly. That's the hovering fly, it's gold. It sometimes can be mistaken for a honeybee, but it hovers and it has two big wings. So it's not rapidly moving its wings, but it's a fly. And it's attracted to uh, composite flowers. So things like hardy marguerite, it's also attracted to buckwheat. Cyphid fly lays its egg where it sees a lot of aphids. And that egg in turn becomes this little dragon that eats 40 aphids a day. So that kind of connection is just so important to checking that particular kind of pest. Uh, that's a gypsy moth caterpillar, and it lays its egg inside of a caterpillar, and its larva in turn destroys the, the, the pest caterpillar. We get all these different species by having all kinds of diversity. That's a minute pirate bug in the top picture. That's a, um, a crab spider that takes the color of its background. The first time I saw one of those crab spiders, it was in a pear blossom, and it was the same white as the pear blossom, and it had those pink stripes, which were the same color as the pear blossom stripes, and it sat right in position, so its stripe was in line with the pear blossom. So it was after a pollinator, which some of those are pests, some of those are, are good. Um, but one of the things you'll often hear is you have codling moth, and there's no one pest that, quote, controls codling moth. And so we rule out the beneficials being able to take care of things. But in truth, nature does this math in a whole different manner. It's what I call beneficial math. And when we get to talking about insects, you know, a big part of that is understanding the life cycle and the timing of a particular pest so we can see where there may be our points of vulnerability. So let's go just a briefly in depth with codling moth. Codling moth is found throughout the country. It was not native to North America, but it got here and it will go after your stone fruits as well as the apples and the pears. And in a warmer climate, they can have as much as five or six generations of codling moth a year, where up where I am, it'll be two generations. You're probably subject to three here. Does that sound right? Anyway, codling moth, any pest has to overwinter. It's gonna overwinter as an egg or a larva or a pupa, or in some cases, even as an adult. Codling moth overwinters as a larva and diapause, which basically means when things warm up in the spring, it goes to find a place to pupate. And all that's about is when does it fly as an adult. So understanding that part um, helps us know that codling moth, about the time the apple trees come into bloom, is flying and male is finding female. And that means that the egg laying begins only once fruit has set. And so the female codling moth can sense where there's fruitlets. And she lays her egg, and it's laid very close to the fruitlet, sometimes on the surface of the fruit, sometimes on the leaf or the twig nearby, but so close that the larva is going to be able to get inside the developing fruitlet within 24 hours. Well, that egg is going to sit there anywhere from 9 to 14 days, 9 to 16 days. And that all has to do with if it's a really warm spring, it happens faster. Cool spring happens slower. And during that time, there are, are bracconid wasps that are going to find that pinhead-sized egg and put their egg inside that egg. And that might be 10, 15, even 20 percent finding because those eggs are out there for a significant amount of time as this mm -hmm. process goes. There is a species of wasp called Trichogamma that can literally find 60% of those codling moth eggs. So in larger cal California orchards, they deliberately release trichogamma in timed phasing so that they can get the majority of those eggs. But here in nature with our braconids, we'll say we got 15% from that step. The egg hatches, a little tiny larva, 24 hours, gets inside the fruitlet. So it, it's not out there for a long time to ingest Bacillus thuringiensis, Bt, some of the things we might spray for caterpillar pests. But in that 24-hour journey, we might have the chickadee find some, or the minute pirate bug might snag a few. So let's call that 5%. Larvas inside the fruit, it's like home base if you're playing tag. And it's going to be in there for 10, 14 days. 
And when it's ready to emerge, it's going to do so in one of two ways. It's either going to crawl out of the fruitlet and work its way down the branch towards the trunk. And what it's doing is it's going, as a species, it knows to go to the base of the tree, that that's where there's usually scaly bark, a good place to pupate. Well, that's a fairly lengthy journey. And so during that journey, more brachynids come and lay their egg in the larva. Uh, we have the bluebirds finding caterpillars. We have uh, yellow jackets and hornets, which we mostly think of as our nemesis. Well, they feed caterpillars to their young. And so that's going to be another 20% chunk because that's a long journey. Or the fruitlet falls to the ground. The caterpillar comes out and it's crawling across the ground to get to the trunk. Well, there are ground beetles, there are ants, there are wolf spiders, a whole bunch of things that can get those caterpillars. And so the number percentage of what's being taken care of through diversity is adding up. That larva goes into pupation. This is where the nuthatch coming down the bark finds some of them. This is where tachnid flies find the pupil case and lay their egg in the pupil case. And so another 10, 15% are taken care of because that pupil case is going to be a seven to nine day process before an adult is ready to fly. When that adult flies, that would be the second generation. That's where California gets into the multiple generations. This is such a long, warm season. But if we add those numbers up through diversity, we're talking of 60 to 70% balancing. And that's what allows us to nudge codling moth with gentler means to keep it from overwhelming because we support the beneficials and we do that through diversity. A cousin of codling moth is the oriental fruit moth. Up where I am, we have the lesser apple worm, but here where peaches grow, it's gonna be oriental fruit moth. And by cousin, I mean it's also an internal feeder. It goes inside. Um, this oriental fruit moth, as well as peach twig borer, which is more of a Western pest, is parasitized by a certain brachynid wasp called Macrocentris. And Macrocentris can knock back as much as 80 to 90% of this moth. So that's, that's a huge ally to have in place. The key to that is understanding how that brachynid wasp overwinters, how it builds its food, food resource base. So it doesn't just eat oriental fruit moth. Its cycle is longer. It also eats things like the larva of the sunflower moth. And so by planting sunflowers, letting them bloom, letting the birds eat the seeds if you don't harvest them themselves, but leaving the stalks and the stubble in place through the winter, you provide a way for Macrocentris to survive to the next year to be able to knock back oriental fruit moth. You know, that, that sense, that notion of winter debris is a huge part of how you start to build beneficial populations. They live somewhere, and as long as we don't go and thoroughly clean and knock everything back, we provide that opportunity. Similarly, strawberries, because there's a food resource there. Similarly, the, the borer that forms those galls on ragweed. These are food resources for a parasite that also controls oriental fruit moth. You know, we know so little of these connections. The few we know, it's like, it's fun to share because it just tells you that biodiversity does so many things. You asked me about Japanese beetle. Japanese beetles overwinter as a grub, two to four inches deep, feeding on the roots usually of grasses, and they like moist conditions. So once Japanese beetle got to North America, it found a real place to launch itself. Well, there is a species of wasp called the spring tiffia that actually, and I have no clue how, flying over the ground, <laughs> can sense that there's a Japanese beetle grub a few inches down there. And it crawls down into the soil and lays its egg on the surface, maybe on the surface, or maybe inserts it into the grub. And that starts to really check Japanese beetle. How do you get spring tiffia? Having plants like the tulip poplar around, having peonies. Again, you don't have to know a lot, but peonies <coughs> are part of bio biodiversity, so you've planted some. Forsythia is another plant that has a good beneficial uh, relationship for tiffia wasps. But as you start to plant and grow these things, Japanese beetle is one that gets on the scene several years later, um, other beneficials follow. You can use milky spore and spread it throughout. Well, we, we'll get into Japanese beetle a little more, but, but this is the beneficial that is one of the key allies. It's not there instantly. The spiders, spiders are so amazing. There's this, I don't know if this is true and I don't know if we could 
like find it right now, but supposedly wherever we are, whatever room we're in, whatever we are outside, if we wrap ourselves in a rug and hide, within three feet of us, there's a spider. Spiders <laughs> are ubiquitous and they take care of so many things. And all those ground spiders, when I get to talking about plum cuculeo and apple maggot fly, these are all species that pupate in the soil. There's a definite moment where somehow the larva has to crawl into the soil. The more spiders you have around, the more spider habitat you create. That's part of that biodiversity picture. The birds and the bats, another big part of it. I mean, a lot of you know this, but it's just understanding how all these things weave together. And, you know, goldenrod is a great spider plant. That's another attribute of a lot of these woodsy edge plants, that it provides spider habitats. So now we're back to steering things towards the forest edge, not just nutritionally, not just fungally, but because it's part of the biodiverse picture that we bring together. Then there are those who still want that kind of Martha Stewart look around their fruit trees. <laughs> and, and here, there are a bunch of plants that have a similar mycorrhizal affiliation with the same species. They're woodsy in nature as well. And these are herbs like rosemary and marjoram and thyme and lavender. Uh, rosemary you'd have to bring in where we are. Do you, does rosemary overwinter outside here? No, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, these are all woodsy plants that if you throw compost or a smattering of ramial wood chips, they stand up to that. So you, you can achieve a certain look, but now you're doing it with plants that have this affiliation to work with the same mycorrhizae. Um, when I talk about cover cropping, one of the, my ideal way to finish, you, you might have to go through buckwheat to clean out an aggressive grass. You might have a whole year ahead before your trees come so that you do winter rye and Austrian peas and vetch to really bulk up on organic matter. But if you can finish with a red or crimson clover with oats that winter kill, you have a plant, the red clovers, have a mycorrhizal affiliation. So they begin to push things in a fungal direction. The white and yellow clovers do not have this. And when you then go to plant, remember, you're, you're, for whatever your cover crop plan is, incorporating lime, what have you, bringing back a clear-cut forest ground, when you go to plant, you're about creating a fungal-dominated ecosystem. So if you came in and tilled and plowed up the red clover, you would lose that element of what you've been trying to build. But they're very easy to fork out. And if you're forking out a three, four foot radius hole, diameter hole, um, that's not that hard to work with. So this is again, is it's just think about the fungal aspect of what you're doing and how you're building the soil. My thought is that you want to, you were explaining forking out red clover versus, did you say tilling it? If you go and till or plow, you're disturbing the soil. Right. So you're losing the mycorrhizal edge that red clover can give you. And ideally, in if this is part of your soil prep plan, the red clover seed is something you inoculate, inoculate with mycorrhizae, but it just begins to push things more fungally, as well as add nitrogen. I mean, it's just it's a really important Why plant to plant a tree, okay. but not everywhere, just yeah. the circle. <laughs> Two-part question. You'd also inoculate with rhizobia bacteria too, right? If you were inoculating clover? Yes. Um, and do you inoculate the same way with the uh, mycorrhizal powder? Just moisten it? Moisten it and, and mix it with the seed. That's it. Okay. So I usually plant clover with oats because oats winter kill. The oats dependably winter kill here. Sometimes See, yes. that's okay. why you want to move north. Spring barley. <laughs> Spring, Spring barley. Spring <laughs> okay. barley w reliably winter kills. But my goal there is that the oat component, which acts as a nurse crop so the clover can really take off, mm -hmm. you, you sigh it, then the clover really grows. The oats winter kill, so you just have clover, you don't have like a sod. Oh. I mean, if you're planting one or two or three or four trees, that's not such a big deal. But if you're planting a hundred trees, it becomes very pertinent that you've prepped for it, but you've kept things fungal. Okay. Another idea is that of chop and drop. So Ramio wood chips, yeah, you can have that chipper, and yeah, you can <coughs> prune it into small bits, but, but there are plants that you can grow in the surrounding part of the orchard. Um, things like Siberian pea shrub to fix nitrogen, buffalo berry, red alders in that category as well. You know, when I cleared my one section of orchard, which was an overgrown pasture, 
I didn't come and stump everything and have the bulldozer level it. And you can't do that in northern New Hampshire anyway. But I had stumps pulled from a, basically a six foot swath, which I cover cropped. But I left the root systems of the trees in the aisle way, which can be mown. But when I swing that sigh and I bring pin cherry and alder in around the tree, it's Ramio wood chips. It's not just mulch, it's, it's really truly Ramio wood chips. So this is part of the thinking that goes into a system that self-sustains itself, and there's different ways to go about it. Then, just having all kinds of fruit growing in the same environs has relevance. So when you're growing the stone fruits, they have extra floral nectar glands at the base of their leaf buds. Well, that's one of the first food resources for the ladybugs in the spring before the, the aphids come on the scene. These are all sorts of things that make it possible for more and more beneficials to be on hand. One of the, the one summer pest of apples, which actually I saw on my sticky trap the day I left, and I thought, okay, apple maggot fly, you have five days to wreck havoc because I can't deal with you now, but I will on the day I get back, um, is the apple maggot fly. And apple maggot flies are a food resource for a certain braconid wasp. And when you also grow blueberries, in the vicinity of your apples. That doesn't mean underneath your apple trees, but in the ecosystem. Well, that's a food resource for the same braconid wasp because blueberry maggot flies get after blueberries earlier. And so, again, it, it's about more food resource, so you have more of the beneficial, which in turn means it keeps more of a balance. And this means that you don't want to see the end of apple maggot fly, and, and we won't. And you don't want to see the end of blueberry maggot fly, and we won't but it means it'll be more balanced because there's more food resources for the good guy. And it's growing them in proximity that you get that advantage. Then this is a really cool picture of uh, cut bamboo and bricks and different types of pipes. And you can build these kind of structures in the midst of your garden as a place where things like the blue orchard bee is gonna build more colonies, you're gonna have more spiders. So there's many, many ways to go about biodiversity and, and make things happen. <laughs>